Has anyone here ever been in a situation as I have where you've been uh, trapped by um, perhaps by friendly politeness or social correctness to, um, to watch someone else's um, slideshow or their video, their home video of their last trip or their last vacation. Has anyone ever been in that position where you've been, yeah. Okay, you, you've got to feel after this kind of a affliction. Have any of you ever been to um, Sequoia National Park? Okay, Gretchen has. Oh, several people. What what do you um, what do you see at, when you go to Sequoia National Park? Trees, yeah, trees. For spring break, uh, Ann and I and Keenan and our granddaughter, we went to Sequoia National Park. And I thought I'd show you a few slides. Uh, you know, and I I never been in all of my life. I'd never been to Sequoia. National Forest. This was the uh, first time. It was interesting because uh, these trees are, are special. There's a lot of them actually have names, and these are the, the biggest, largest trees on the planet. Some of these trees can grow to 300 feet that way, and, and 60 feet around in diameter. So by volume, they are the largest trees. On, they're big. And, 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 not, not only, and, and there are tall trees and fat trees, and, and, and not only are, are these trees big, but they're old. I mean, some of these trees are really old, to 3,500 years. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, this, this is before the, the city of Rome, okay? I mean, this, was bef this, was, this was, I mean, Jesus and uh, the Buddha and Confucius and Socrates, these trees were growing while all these folks were in business. Cleopatra, amazing. I mean, th these trees are older, many of them, than um, Kleindorfer's hardware store. Uh, I mean, that's, that's how old these trees are. Uh, they've been around. Well, I was, I was amazed to, to see these trees and their bigness, but I became a little a little shock, a little, little, it was disconcerting when I began to notice that on a number of these trees, there were burn marks. I mean, they were scarred, charred. And I immediately thought, how can this be? I mean, this is a national park. And I, I immediately, of course, presumed the vandals had been burning these trees or the careless cigarette smokers, you know, flicking their, their ashes, and, and I was upset. Well, then I began to do my homework and read some of the National Park Service information. And amazingly enough, some of these dark, charred places, okay, like that, in fact, all the way up. And I thought, how could this be in a national park? Because, I mean, the reason you have a national park especially a national park of trees, is to protect them. Well, I thought this was pretty terrible that the vandals or whomsoever had precipitated this kind of, um, um, this kind of violence against these great trees. But then I started reading the material, and by golly, the National Park Service, when they took over this land, they thought just like I did. And they immediately started uh, enforcing uh, what they talk about as aggressive fire suppression. Okay, aggressive fire suppression. And any time the lightning strikes would happen, as they naturally do, uh, and these fires would start, they would put them out. Seemed like a good idea. But as with many things in life, there were unintended consequences. And Shortly after they began to implement their policy, they discovered that the sequoias were not happy. I mean, they were so unhappy, they stopped reproducing. Boom. And as it was revealed, 
And as the National Park Service has since learned, the seedlings of these, the seeds of the sequoias require a base of ash uh, for the nutrients they need and everything else to get going. But not only that, that um, if there are not these regular natural but moderate fires that just happen as a result of lightning strikes, um, if those don't happen, then uh, the carpenter ants will eat up the little baby sequoias. And not only that, see these, these sequoias are, are special because they, their bark uh, and, and the tree itself has very little sap, almost none. So therefore it's mostly fire resistant. However, its cousin, the white fir, which grows real fast and there are a bunch of them and lots of needles that are very flammable. Well, uh, those things, if, if you knock out the fires, then those things are everywhere. And not only do they create a canopy over the, uh, the forest, preventing light to get to the little seeds, um, but uh, when if you stop the fires, then they just keep piling on more and more flammable debris. And when you have a fire, then boom, it's hot, intense, and destroys property, wildlife, trees, sequoias. So the National Park Service went on a journey. And they went on a, tra they experienced a transformation and now they allow these natural lightning strikes to take place and these fires to burn. And guess what? The sequoias are back and thriving, but they've got all these um, big scars and big burnt spots, but that's the way it's supposed to be. And they're healthy and vital and reproducing. Fires are part of life. Fire is a part of life. They, um, and we can get rid of the fires. We can engage in aggressive fire suppression, but then we get rid of life. The, um, what an interesting moment in regards to the practice of depth in the human family. And I would suggest that as I survey the practice of depth in our human family, I mostly see that it is impotent, bankrupt, distant, remote, um, disconnecting, unengaging, boring. You may say, well, why is that? Well, the reason is because we have engaged in, in our depth practices, and in, incidentally, the institutions that are charged with keeping this dimension of life vital, we have engaged in aggressive fire suppression. How did that happen? We have replaced mystery-centered depth with human-centered sentimentality, sap, and rationality. And the result you can see everywhere in mediocrity and disconnection. So what do we do? Well, once again, we have to let in the light. We have to somehow burn off the underbrush and open up the canopy so the light can come in. Uh, Any time in human history when the infinite and the timeless connect with the finite and time, 
It is incendiary. Transformation happens. But we have to let the light in. A little later this evening, I'll drive home up South Walnut Street. And when I drive up South Walnut Street, I, um, I pass the uh, family business that my grandparents started and, and in which I grew up. And um, um, my grandfather died a little over 50 years ago. Uh, I was 10. And he, um, uh, he was my best buddy. And even today, uh, when I bring him to mind, uh, I can get all choked up. And my grandmother, who died a little over 35 years ago, the same thing. I mean, I'm, I, am, I am full of sap. And I uh, can emotionally melt to think about my grandmother. And when I think about her in the past tense, or when I think about my grandfather in the past tense, and when I drive by, as I do often several times a day, um, I, um, I honor my grandparents. I honor their presence. Um, I do not honor the concept of my grandparents. I do not honor the memory of my grandparents. I honor my grandparents. When time and timelessness intermingle, that is when transformation happens. Um, our son Zachary, who died in 2008, will uh, come into my consciousness uh, many times, every day. And uh, I honor his presence. And I do not honor the concept of Zachary. I do not honor the memory of Zachary in the past tense. I honor Zachary. When time and timelessness intermingle, transformation happens. An other world appears. And I'm not talking about some other time or some other place that's going to show up after I die. That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about that reality that appears in the here and the now when I turn the dial on my deep relationship to life right now. Fire is real.